And welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. And Lamar Waldron is in the studio with us, and he has a new book out, Watergate, The Hidden History. Lamar, welcome back to the program. Great to be here, Tom. My first time here in person with you. Yeah, well, and, th- and thank you for joining us. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing piece of work. Um, Watergate, most people think of Watergate as a third-rate burglary. Uh, now, you've got this 800-page book here that, you, that just came out. A little, little, little over 800 pages. Yeah, it's a, a substantial chunk of research. Um, and you suggest that, no, it wasn't a third-rate burglary. What's the deal? Well, I mean, third-rate burglary is one of the things you always hear. Third-rate burglary, cover-up worse than the crime. Uh, you know, Washington Post brought down Nixon. None of those things are true. And some of them actually flow, flow from the spin that Nixon had his own men putting out right after the burglary. So it's interesting how they've taken hold. It wasn't a third-rate burglary. First off, there were four attempts to burglarize the Watergate uh, offices of the Democratic National Committee, plus the very same crew tried to break into the Chilean embassy here in Washington looking for the same thing uh, just a couple of weeks before the first so, Watergate burglary. So, how, so it's not one burglary. It's several. Yeah, G. Gordon Liddy has, on the record, said, I don't know what we were looking for or why, how this thing got so big. What were they looking for? What, what, what was Watergate all about, and why should... Now, the anniversary is the 17th of this month. It's next week. That's correct. The 40th sh- anniversary. 40th anniversary. Why should we care about it? Well, number one, we should care because it has a lot of relevance for today, especially in the light of we're in a presidential election year this year, just like 1972, and, and as we can see with the Wisconsin results, I mean, the Republicans, conservatives are doing a lot of the same things they were doing back then. And in fact, it was Richard Nixon that actually perfected so many of the techniques we see used in presidential and congressional elections today. And unless we can learn you know, how those came about, how they were applied, I, I don't know Richard how Nixon we're going to have— Richard Nixon perfected, for example, what? Well, all of these, these what, what, what he loved to call dirty tricks, what most people would call campaign crimes, some of them didn't quite cross the line, but I mean, he was the one who, like people associate with Newt Gingrich, but a lot of your, most of your Republican candidates will make these outrageous, outrageous statements about their opponents, right. things that are clearly not true, things that Nixon would later say on the tapes, oh, I knew that wasn't true, I knew that wasn't true, but from the start of his campaign, he knew that making outrageous claims they get reported. They distract the mainstream media. They even distract what liberal Obama's media not a there citizen. is. Exactly. That's why you would think, okay, that's, big been, lie. that's been disproven so much, but you're right. It's the big lie. We know that works, and we know, and, and you know, people associate those big Goebbels lies. Goebbels actually invented that. I mean, you know, but Nixon was the one who reprised it for American politics. Is that the difference? Right. Now, well, one thing we have to keep in mind, this shocked me when I was doing the book, and the book does give a, a historical context to Nixon, so you really understand what he did and why, I, I think like never before, because I, I didn't realize these things. Right. And, and as you know, Goebbels got a lot of his propaganda techniques from uh, an, an American who created them for Wall Street. Oh, you're talking about uh, Freud's nephew, uh, what was his name? Well, uh, the one Bernays? in the picture is Edward, yeah, Edward, Edward, Edward Bernays. Yeah. So, so we have, you know, and, and, and then things start to make sense when you realize, you know, even the Nazis and the fascists, they were just applying these proven Wall Street techniques that we see working today, and they work for candidates today. The money, you know, Nixon was the guy who was perfecting getting this big corporate money, getting the big business tycoons of his day. In those days, it wasn't the, Cot- uh, the Koch brothers. It was Howard Hughes. And, and using that money to just overwhelm your opponents. I think in Wisconsin, uh, the, uh, the Democratic candidate was outspent almost 10 to 1. Mm-hmm. When, when Nixon won in 1968 over the eventual nominee, Hubert Humphrey, he outspent Humphrey 2 to 1. So it's getting the big corporate money, the big business tycoons, and then basically doing whatever is required to win. So th- those are, are some of the most important uh, and, you know, and, and, broader and there was a guy who important. worked for Richard Nixon um, who got this proposal for something called GOP TV, whose name was Roger Ailes. And, and Roger Ailes played such a big part for Nixon starting in that 1968 election, where that was one of the first elections where the candidate wasn't out meeting the people, not like when Harry Truman overcame the, the he attempt. He did his whistle to, stop tour across the country. Which, which, which Truman had to do to win to overcome because they had the Republicans had rebranded the Republican Depression as the Great Depression, and most newspapers wouldn't use that term. So Truman took that term and reminded folks, hey, it was the Republican Depression. We're we're barely out of that. 
and it worked for him. Wow. But, but, but the same things are, are, are happening now. And you've got Roger Ailes, and he was perfecting those techniques for Nixon that helped Nixon win that, that in many ways, a very close election in 68. And now that's applied to the whole country. And, and in so many things, the Southern strategy that Nixon used, that subtly racist but, but more appealing to those middle-of-the-road independent voters, that Southern strategy was Nixon's creation, very, very uh, calculated development. And now that's basically applied, and all those elements of the Southern strategy are how the GOP basically have taken control of many parts of the whole country, you know, far outside that's, the South. That's remarkable. Shane, if you could pull up that clip that we had of LBJ yesterday, um, uh, you know, if, if you can get that, let me know when you've got it. Uh, I wanted to play that for Lamar and get his take on it. Um, so I asked the question, what were they looking for when they broke into the Watergate? The, the most surprising thing to me is 40 years, we're almost at the 40th anniversary of the final, the fourth Watergate break-in, the one with the arrest, and, and there have been two big questions that no one has had the answer to. You won't find the answer to these questions in all the presidents. Men, anywhere, what were the burglars looking for, and why was Nixon so desperate to get it? Because when you realize mm -hmm. there was the Chilean embassy burglary, four at the Watergate, the night of the Watergate burglary, the final one, they were supposed to go to the McGovern campaign headquarters, too. They were that desperate. They were so desperate. Uh, one of the burglars, Frank uh, Fiorini, who Frank later Sturgis. changed his name to Frank Sturgis because yeah. as Frank Fiorini, he was known as a mafia operative uh -huh. for Florida Godfather Santo Traficante. Right. As Frank Sturgis, uh, he was a soldier of fortune, fought for and then against Fidel Castro. Right. But uh, he was, they were so desperate, they took the door off its hinges. They were that desperate. The reason they were desperate was they worried that the Democrats had a document that could have totally torpedoed Nixon's chances in the 72 election no matter who he was running against. And this was a document that documented the CIA attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro that began when Nixon was vice president, running Nin that very... 19, 1960. Another very close election against okay. JFK, and he knew any little advantage Nixon knew he could get. So if he could have Fidel killed right before the election, this, that was the original... Because that was one of the big things surprised. JFK was beating him up about in 1960, was that he let Castro go communist, because originally the, the Cuban Revolution was not a communist revolution. Right, and, 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 and JFK was advocating, you know, tougher stands, and Nixon claimed, well... Uh, JFK knew all about what was planned, but nothing was planned. There was no big amphibious invasion planned. What Nixon had planned, and it was Nixon personally, that had the CIA do a deal with the mafia to assassinate Fidel before the election. So they worried that there was a document, a specific document. And, and, and by the way, we have the official Watergate, Senate Watergate Committee memos on this for the first time anywhere actually printed in the in book. In your book, Watergate, The Hidden History, we're talking with Lamar Waldron, the author. Right. Th these are things you won't see in all the presidents. Man, you will not see these in any other Watergate book. People have been looking for these for, for 30 years. And, and, and sure enough, there was a real document. It started when Nixon was vice president in 1960, and it ended in December of 71, when Nixon had again had the CIA try to kill Fidel Castro this time down in Chile, because Nixon had mounted, uh -huh. used a lot of veterans of early 60s Cuban operations to mount a big effort to topple Salvador Is Allende in Chile. Is this why all the burglars Chile. were CIA guys? Every single one of those burglars were CIA guys. A fact that the CIA worked hard to cover up at the time and right. did, and forever after, even today, they, they reluctantly admit it. A lot of that stayed hidden. Frank Fiorini was part of the CIA mafia plots under Nixon. He was a contract CIA agent. That wasn't confirmed until 19, 1980. But all of them, one one burglar was, a, was an active CIA agent, not just a retired CIA agent. Amazing. We'll be back with more with Lamar Waldron. His new book, Watergate, The Hidden History. 15 minutes past the hour. Stick around. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Right back with more of Lamar Waldron and his book, Watergate, The Hidden History. This is amazing stuff. The crimes of Richard Nixon being played out again today. Free Speech TV right now on Pacifica. So well, we're back. Tom Hartman here with you. Lamar Waldron in the studio with us. And uh, Lamar, just just. Uh, moving along on this, uh, uh, you know, this topic, the book, uh, Watergate, The Hidden History, and there's more to the subtitle, 
Um, well, the important subtitle is Nixon, the Mafia, and the CIA. Nixon, the Mafia, and the CIA. Okay, so how did Nixon get involved with the Mafia and the CIA? Well, Nixon was involved with using these campaign dirty tricks, uh, intelligence, and mafia money, and big corporate money, from the start of his political life. In 1946, when he first ran for office, having made a lot of money, get this, his political stake came from two places. One was from gambling in the Navy, where he had been an officer in the Navy, and he was an incredibly great uh, poker player. And he came home with what in today's dollars would be many tens of thousands of dollars to start his political campaign. We don't associate. So he got playing state, poker? He got, I mean, yeah, this is just well documented. Stephen Ambrose, the, uh, I mean, that's just well, well documented. The other place he was staked was one of his last assignments before he left the Navy. He did encounter files talking about certain American Wall Street types who had been dealing with the Nazis. Now, one of those people actually had a fairly good reason to deal with the Nazis. That was Alan Dulles, right. who was with the OAS. And so there was actually a semi-reasonable uh, uh, reason for Dulles to be dealing with the Nazis because he was fighting them. However, you didn't want that coming out at the time because there were a lot of big American corporations that had actively helped the Nazis. So IBM, uh, most famously. Uh, right, IBM, Exxon, Ford, lots of them. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Ron Brothers Harriman and uh, uh, Prescott Bush. Exactly. So Dulles did not want to be lived, lumped in with those people. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, he arranged to also provide funding from the Eastern Establishment for this California congressman to run Richard Nixon. Now, the Eastern Establishment, was the, that was the group that George Herbert Walker Bush came from. Oh, sure, who also sure. spent his life in the CIA. Sure. So it's like it's like so Nixon is getting this support, and Alan Dulles, of course, for some of your listeners who don't have the gray hair we had, did become the CIA director uh, under Vice President Nixon. Right. And so, but the other big funding sources for uh, Nixon in '46, one was big tycoons like Howard Hughes and, and slush funds, uh, several slush funds at the start, because Nixon was like, I can't live on a congressman's salary. I need. You need to match that with some business money for my personal use. The other place was from Mickey Cohen in the Los Angeles Mafia. Uh, uh -huh. Nixon's political fixer, his strategist, his Karl Rove on steroids was a guy by the name of Maury Ch uh, Chotner. And Chotner and his brother represented uh, over 200 bookies for Mickey Cohen. And in one of his races, Nixon actually went to a ballroom where Mickey Cohen, a very flamboyant Los Angeles uh, gangster, who, who did not last because he was so flamboyant. You last in the mafia if you don't get publicity. Right. Cohen loved the limelight. He actually got Nixon to come to a ballroom in, in, in Chotner, and, um, and, and, and uh, Mickey Cohen basically shook down all of his bookies. Hey, we got to raise money for this guy. Nixon got up, said a few words, and split. And, and so Nixon tried to keep his distance, but he wanted that money, and they, they supported Nixon, Mickey Cohen, and the mob in his Senate race. And then, th th this is important, in the 1960 election, you may have heard... Hold that thought. Sure. We'll, we'll continue that right after the break, especially if this is important. Oh. Okay. Lamar Waldron is with us. We will be right back with more of Lamar Waldron, his new book, Watergate, The Hidden History, Nixon, the CIA, and the Mafia. Nixie, Nixon, the Mafia, and the CIA, right. <laughs> okay, there you go. We'll be right back. Occupying the media three hours a day, five days a week. Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. And Lamar Waldron is in the studio with us. And uh, welcome back, Lamar. So we were just talking about how uh, Richard Nixon, basically his whole political career, uh, he, he started out making, making the money that he, his original grub stake to be a politician in 46 was money he made playing poker when he was in the Navy. That's right. And then he hooked up with Mickey Cohen, the mafia guy out of Los Angeles, who did a fundraiser for him with all his bookies, and, and this launched Richard Nixon's political career, mob money. That's right. So now we flash ahead to 1960, the election he's facing, Senator John F. Kennedy, who, who came to prominence with his, with his younger brother Bobby, going after the mafia, because under 
the Eisenhower-Nixon administration, the mafia had free reign in the whole country and pretty much free reign in Havana. I mean, they could do whatever they wanted. J. Edgar Hoover, FBI director, denied the mafia existed. So Senator Kennedy spearheaded these Senate crime hearings, and he dragged Sam Giancana and Jimmy Hoffa and Carlos Marcello, all these you know big godfathers and their allies like Hoffa, and, and, and that's what launched JFK into that presidential race. So now Nixon is is bigger in every way, more corporate money, more Howard Hughes money, more mafia money. The only union, of course, in America who would consider supporting Nixon was the Teamsters. Hoffa was facing charges because of all the attention the Kennedys had brought on him, didn't want to get indicted. So there was a $1 million bribe in two installments. First installment was was picked up by Jimmy Hoffa from Carlos Marcello, the mafia godfather of Louisiana and Texas. Contributing was the godfather of of parts of Florida, Santo Traficante, Tony Provenzano from New Jersey, even Sam Giancana from Chicago. They all, and and there was like literally a suitcase full of money witnessed by a guy who later turned FBI informant. That was money for Nixon. And there was another installment later when $1 million to stall the indictment against Hoffa and get Teamster support for Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that was going on in September 1960. Well documented. That same time, Nixon had had the CIA do a deal with the mafia to kill Fidel. They started with a mob uh, with Sam Giancana's man in Las Vegas and Hollywood named Johnny Roselli, who will later get gruesomely murdered. And, and, and Roselli, of course, brought Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante into that plot, and eventually Carlos Marcello. The guys who killed Kennedy. So in the, who confessed, <laughs> credible confessions to killing Kennedy. So in the same month, September 1960, right before the election, you had the CIA mafia plots to kill Fidel with some of the same mobsters giving Nixon $1 million. Okay, that's what Watergate was really all about. Nixon knew that if that came out, if the CIA mafia plots came out, that would be bad enough. Yeah. But a lot of people on the right wouldn't care that he was going to kill that's Fidel. Incredible. So that's what he was trying to study. They would to, care they, that's what if they he were. got a million dollars. Now, now, let me play a clip for you. This sure. is Lyndon Johnson um, in the in the 74, no, 72. 72 election. No, in the 68 election. 68 election. In the 68 election, um, LBJ had negotiated peace with the Vietnamese. That's exactly right. And, and, it, and Humphrey would have won. That's and, ex- and Nixon put an end to it. And this tape just came out last year. This is from the Lyndon Johnson. I'm sure you probably heard it. But let, let me just play this. This is LBJ caught talking to Everett Dirksen, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate. Here's the latest, latest uh, information we got. The agent says that uh, she's just, they just talked to the boss in New Mexico. Uh-huh. And that he says that you must hold out. Just hold on until after the election. We know what Chu is saying to him out there. Yeah. We're pretty well informed on both ends. Now, I'm reading their hand, Everett. I don't want to get this in the campaign. That's right. And they oughtn't to be doing this. This is treason. I know. I know, says Everett Dirksen. Yeah, it's treason. I know. And, and here's Lyndon Johnson saying, you know, okay, we've caught Richard Nixon, you know, in the, in the campaign, the 68 campaign, blowing up the peace process. And he did. And, and the war extended for, for all those years. I mean, Jerry Ford finally ended it. Had, had, but that had nothing to do with Watergate, or did it? Well, what it had to do was, with, was Nixon would do anything to win. I mean, and that was true from his first election as a congressman. Including having a war that kills 50,000 people. And, and, and as you said, LBJ called it treason. Now, I actually did a calculation. It wasn't easy. If, and, and, and so there was supposed to be a peace and, and a, a ceasefire with right. Vietnam right before that election. Right. Nixon torpedoed it. He, he told the dictator of South Vietnam uh, not to be part of the deal. By the way, Nixon was getting money from that dictator and many, many of America's worst dictators we supported. And that was illegal, too. So Nixon is actually responsible for almost exactly half the casualties during the Vietnam War. Because if there had been a ceasefire, you know, right before the election, I mean, that's just one of the most sad and tragic things. So Nixon's responsible for over 25,000 dead American soldiers and over a million dead Vietnamese. That, 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 That is my calculation. Just to win an election. Just to win, when I, and I get this, he, he felt a little bad. So, so after the election, after Johnson let Nixon know that, hey, I know what you did, mm-hmm. Nixon went back to Diem, the, the dictator of South Vietnam, and said, hey, maybe you should do a deal. Plus, Nixon was going to come into office, right? right. And Diem wouldn't do it. I mean, Nixon thought it was something he could turn on and off like a faucet. Right. 
But he just didn't, I bet to him it was winning the election. Amazing. We have one minute left, Lamar. What do you think is the, one of the most important carry homes? The most important carry home is all the secrecy still about Watergate. When you see what can still come out today, the first thing, not just linking the mafia to Watergate, but saying the mafia was the reason for Watergate, there's still between 50,000 and 1 million pages of files related in some way to Watergate that are still secret, that should be released under the 1992 now, JFK Act. Could this be because uh, J. Edgar Hoover was being blackmailed by the mafia? That's actually not the reason. The reason is national security. It goes back to every one of the Watergate burglars being not just a CIA veteran or current, but working on those anti-Castro operations of the early 60s, Nixon is the guy who started the sanctions against Cuba that are continued today. And as long as all of those files about E. Howard Hunt, Bernard Barker, A.M. World, Manuel Artemi, all these names that you'll read about in the book, as long as they remain, a lot of those files remain secret, we're going to keep in this Cold War we have with Cuba that Nixon started back in 1960. Right, to get elected. Right, to get elected. <laughs> For the most craven of reasons. Amazing. Lamar Waldron, The Watergate, The Hidden History, Nixon, The Mafia, and The CIA is the book. Check it out. Lamar, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. We'll be back. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. Actually, you know, I'd like to dig even a little deeper into this. I'm going to ask Lamar to stick around a little longer. I, we can talk about the Kennedy assassination as well. Stick around. Stick around.